Okay, so in this lecture, we'll be covering safe sex and sexual health. But first, we'll be discussing sexual desire. So on average, uh, men typically have higher sex drives than women. They experience more intense sexual desires and are more motivated to engage in sexual activity more often than women. In fact, um, one study found that men reported 37 episodes of sexual desire per week, while men, um, women only reported about nine. However, this may differ among individuals. So some people may have higher libidos um, or some women specifically may have higher libidos than men, but on average, men typically have a higher sex drive when compared to women. These differences in sex drives can create tension in romantic relationships, specifically for heterosexual couples. When couples have different expectations when it comes to sexual behaviors and frequency, it can lead to conflict. These differences in sexual desire can get worse with time because as women get older, their sex drive tends to decrease. Because men want sex more often than women, they tend to be dissatisfied with the amount of sex that they are having. As a result, women are often labeled as gatekeepers for sexual intimacy because um, women will often decide when the couple engages in intercourse. In many cases, women hold a lot of power when it comes to sex, and as a result, men will sometimes have to sweeten the deal for women. These sexual desires, differences, and how to overcome these differences can be explained by waffle brains versus spaghetti brains, which is a term often used in couples counseling. It's not scientifically backed, but it's a way to kind of conceptualize it. Um, so it's a way to think about it struggles with intimacy, but it, yeah, it isn't backed by science. So you're not going to find this in like a peer reviewed journal. Men, though, are typically described as having waffle brains. Uh, they are able to compartmentalize their desires and goals like squares in a waffle. So when a man gets off of work and he sees his partner, um, he is more likely to be able to sh shut down the stress of work and move to having sexual desires for his partner. Meanwhile, women have um, more spaghetti brains. Um, so it can be difficult for women to untangle the stress or event of days rather um, than focusing on um, like their partner. So our brains are more like an interconnected mess. So when a woman gets off work and she sees her partner looking really attractive, um, she might not be able to shut down the stress of work or the events of the day as easily as her male partner. So if the male partner wants to engage in stress, he kind of has to help her untangle the mess of the day and help her unwind. And there's a couple of ways couples do that. So maybe helping them with chores. So that's one less stressor they have talking things out um maybe bringing home flowers things like that now let's talk about hookup cultures um hookups and hookup culture so hookups used to mean spontaneous um getting together like on the fly um um and like casual one night stands so but the definition of that has kind of evolved over time. So hookups don't have to necessarily include sex because the definition of a hookup varies from person to person. Hookups are more common because there's a belief that it's part of the college culture. Um, thus, it's like the social thing to do. Hookup culture is fairly prominent on college campuses. Alcohol is often involved, which is likely due to lowered inhibitions, thus making you more open to different sexual behaviors and attitudes you normally wouldn't have while sober. Those who have experienced hookups often report believing that the other person was more comfortable with the hookup than they were themselves, and this is true for both men and women. This idea of, like, this is what everyone is doing, even though I don't really want to do it, um, is really prevalent um, and it makes hookups seem more normal and just part of like the social culture even when people aren't necessarily excited to do them it's just kind of like the cultural norm or the social norm past research has found that college students typically over report their sexual partners so the truth is maybe not everyone is engaging in hookup culture as often as we think okay this kind of leads us to the discussion of safe and sensible sex. So about 75% of students, um, college students in particular, have reported having a hookup. About half of these college students have had a hookup within the last year. A majority of hookups occur with an acquaintance or someone that they don't really know very well. 
Sometimes hookups are between mutual friends and acquaintances, but that's pretty rare. Some hookups just involve kissing or heavy petting is the term, but it's like touching. Um, but about half of them will include oral sex or intercourse, especially when both part me parties have been drinking alcohol. Hookups rarely involve safe sex, unfortunately, especially when alcohol is involved. During hookups, condoms are only used about half of the time, so the odds are not good. So our next question is, why do people engage in unsafe sex? There's a couple different reasons for that. We know people have sex without con protection, and that can be super unsafe. So people who engage in sex without the use of protection are at risk for contracting STIs or could become pregnant, um, but people still engage in it anyway. First, people will often underestimate the risks of unsafe sex. The chance of someone contracting HIV after a single unprotected sexual encounter is actually less than 1%, even less than that if you're on medication. Um, but if you engage in low frequency events enough, times the risk of contracting HIV significantly increases. So for example, this is not the best example, but it's the example I have. Um, say you have a burger once in a while, you contracting heart disease is not going to be that high of a risk because it's only every once in a while. But if you start having hamburgers every single day, you're your likelihood of contracting um, a heart disease is increased because you're engaging in that behavior more often. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it could be. Um, people also underestimate their sexual partner's recent sexual activity um, and their chances of having an STI, especially when they find them attractive. So if we want sex bad enough, we often underestimate the risk that we'll contract a, um, an STI from our partner or um, from um or like getting pregnant by them the illusion of unique vulnerability which is the belief that bad things are generally more likely to happen to other people than to us also influences our ability to es estimate risks so we fall under the impression that others can contract stis through unprotected sex but it wouldn't like happen to us obviously um that's kind of the thinking however people who think that they're not vulnerable to STIs often don't use condoms which means they're actually at a much higher risk for contracting an STI so the illusion of unique vulnerability which is again the belief that bad things generally happen to other people not to us can put you at an increased risk for contracting an STI or becoming pregnant getting caught in the moment um and having high sexual arousal can also cloud judgment as well so when we're very sexually aroused, diverse sexual behaviors and moral attitudes may seem more appealing um, and acceptable. So essentially, when we get carried away in the moment, it's harder to say no to certain sexual behaviors, like putting on a condom. And so therefore, we might not be, you know, as, as um, strong in our opinion that we need to use a condom. Intoxication can also affect our decision making, especially when it comes to sex. So when people are drunk, they are less likely to put a condom on, especially during hookups. During hookups, condoms are only used about half of the time. The reason people are less likely to or more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior while intoxicated is due to a phenomenon known as alcohol myopia. And alcohol myopia um, is defined as the reduction of a person's ability to think about and process all the information available to them while they're intoxicated. So when y'all go to chimneys or crickets for drinks, your bodies will typically react a certain way. So your ability to walk steadily, you might talk louder. Um, it might be harder to think through things. Going to the bathroom might be a whole production because you're trying very hard to focus and everything's kind of blurry around you. Um, your decision making and your ability to engage in normal behaviors is greatly impacted by alcohol. So imagine having all of those symptoms, being a little bit dizzy, not having full control of your limbs or, you know, you're talking louder, your thought processor is a little bit muddy. Think about all those symptoms that you have when you're drunk and then try to think about having sex with someone at the same time. That's a lot. Intoxication um, makes things extra difficult and it's also difficult to give and receive consent while under the influence of alcohol. Um. Oftentimes when I teach this in an in-person class, I'll have students come up to the front 
and I'll teach them how to put on a condom, but, um, and to check to see if a condom is usable. So a way to check to see if a condom is usable is, um, there's like a bubble when you press on it, um, like an air bubble. So if you, there isn't a bubble, that means that the condom's likely been punctured. And then there's typically an expiration on the date, uh, um, with a date on the back. I don't have like my supplies to show y'all, but there's an expiration date on the back. Um, and so I have my students come up to the front and I ask them, how long would you take to find the expiration date and do the bubble test for your condoms while you're drunk? And they were like, maybe like um, two minutes. I say, okay. And so I give them drunk goggles and I have them try to find the expiration date on <laughs> the condom. And I give them the time limit that the class has set. And categorically, no one is ever able to get the condom on and find the expiration date and make sure that the condom is safe to use um, while drunk. Because oftentimes they can't like put the condom on correctly. They can't see if it's safe to use. Um, so alcohol myopia not only makes you less willing to use a condom, but also it makes it harder to safely use a condom, even if you have the intention, because you can't really see. So don't use better to be sober for that interact that kind of interaction okay moving along um pluralistic in ignorance which is defined by the phenomenon of when people wrongly believe that their feelings and beliefs are different from those of others can influence people who engage in unsafe sex so most young adults want to have safe sex but they wrongly believe that it's unpopular, so they don't ask their partner to use contraception. Women will often believe that men hold more negative attitudes towards wearing condoms than they actually do. So women tend to not ask their partner to wear a condom, or they believe that it's like cooler to be like, oh, you don't have to use one. I'm on like the pill or whatever. Um, and that's because of pluralistic ignorance. Abstinence only education can lead to people engaging in unsafe sex as well. I know in Texas, it's kind of the norm to have abstinence only education. Um, and But for those of you who didn't get that kind of education, the goal of abstinence only education is to convince teens not to have sex at all and to wait to marriage. However, teens have sex either way and abstinence only education um, has been found to be pretty ineffective. And it puts a lot of teens at risk for having unsafe sex because they never learned how to have safe sex. Um, and a lot of times parents aren't going to teach their teens how to do it because it's an awkward conversation. So they're not getting this information anywhere. And if they are getting information, it might be inaccurate because they're like going to online sources or asking their friends who know about as much as them probably. Um, so that can also lead to unsafe sex. Power, which is defined as the ability to get your partner to do what you want, also influences your ability to have safe sex. So when couples have an unequal power back balance they are less likely to use condoms if the more powerful partner doesn't want to use one self-control is also the ability to manage our impulses practice self-restraint and generally do the right thing when it comes to perseverance and effort when people have low self-control they are more likely to take sexual risks the most common deterrent of safe sex is that people often enjoy um, sex more when they don't wear a condom both men and women report enjoying sex more when condoms are not involved because they perceive the sex to be more intimate and emotionally satisfying. As a result, most people can be talked out of using a condom by their partner for this reason. Okay. So now that we've kind of talked about unsafe sex, why it happens, um, let's talk about how to have safe sex. So there are two types of contraceptions, like two broad types. There's barrier protection and hormonal protection. So first we'll cover barrier protection and barrier protection um, that tends to produce that, well, blah, sorry, let me get this straight. Barrier protection that prevents STIs and pregnancy include the male condom and the female condom. A note for the female and male condoms, you don't wanna use them together because they can create friction and create holes in the plastic or the latex. Um, and that can not only make intercourse is very uncomfortable, but it incre can increase your likelihood of contracting an STI or getting pregnant. There's barrier protection that prevents, again, pregnancy, but not necessarily STIs, and those are going to be the diaphragm, the cervical cap, and the sponge. The most common form of barrier protection that's used is the male condom. And then see on the screen, we have the female condom. This kind of looks like a tunnel. Um, it's very different from a male condom because it 
Mekhan Mak comes to a point, and this is more of like a circular kind of thing. Okay. Sorry, that last slide was an activity that I do with um, my class in person. There are 11 steps of putting on and taking off a condom though, and I might send that to y'all um, during this like during this um, semester, but we're gonna move on. So we're gonna talk about hormonal forms of protection. So hormonal forms of protection only protect against pregnancy and not STIs. So forms of hormonal birth control include contraception pills, so the birth control pill, which can be daily, or um, an emergency pill, which is often known as uh, Plan B. Um, a thing about the Plan B that's like a common misconception is that people think that Plan B causes you to miscarry um, a child. That isn't the case. If the egg is already fertilized, um, Plan B will not work. So Plan B is like an extra shot of your regular birth control pill. It's just more of that hormone. Um, I can't remember the hormone's name right now, but it's like an extra dose of that. So if the egg is already fertilized, it's not gonna it's not gonna prevent the pregnancy from happening. Um, that's why um, you have to take your Plan B within seventy two hours or three days because um, it usually takes like five-ish days for the sperm to fertilize the egg. Um, so if it's already fertilized, it's just not gonna happen. Also with plan B, um, I think there is like, I think it's 155 pounds is like the weight limit for most, like the regular plan B. Um, and as you increase in weight, it just becomes less effective, but they have plan B available uh, for people who are over that 155 limit, which is a very small limit in the reality of like, that's just, that's not a huge limit. That's like a very small weight limit to have. Like you think it'd be larger, but it's not. Um, but so if you are over 155 pounds, you'll need to go to a doctor um, to um, get that specific type of plan B. I think you might be able to find it online too. I don't know for sure though. Anyway, moving along. Um, there's also the shot, and that can be given about every three um, months. There's the IUD, which can work for three to six years, depending on what you, which one you get. Um, the patch, which only needs to be worn for three weeks before being changed. And the implant, which lasts to up to four years. And the intravaginal ring, which just needs to be changed every month. And then finally, we have um, the effectiveness chart. So um, vasectomies and hysterectomies um, or getting your tubes tied is obviously one of the most effective ways. And then we have the implant and the IUD. Those are pretty effective. Um, and the least effective are going to be fertil fertility awareness based methods. So this is when um, you just track your ovulation and figure out when not to have sex um, and then spermicide. And then finally, um, if you're in Lubbock, here are a couple different resources that you can use. Um, we have the RISE office on campus. They have a lot more information than I could give you in this course. Um, and they're really good about teaching about consent, teaching about different types of contraceptive methods. Um, they have free condoms, female condoms, all kinds of things available there. Um, and then we have the student health services. Again, that's on Tech's campus and they can do pap smears and um, and or STI testing. I had a student ask me um, about the past year and I was like, I'm not a doctor, but we as a class talked about it and what was involved. Um, it's not as scary as a lot of people think. It's really important. And they just changed the requirement to getting it every year to every three years, which is kind of a relief because although it's not the worst thing in the world, it's not very comfortable. Um, and then moving along, uh, Lubbock City Health Department also can test you for um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and HIV, and it's by appointment only. And then there's Planned Parenthood in Lubbock. They can do STD testing, prescribe uh, PrEP medication, and they can also um, help you with getting access to birth control, um, and they're by appointment only. So yeah, hope y'all learned a lot and use condoms. All right.